Hey guys, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study. Thank you for joining me again. We're still looking at the principalities and powers. Uh, we we looked in the first segment of how the principalities somewhat, not even somewhat or kind of, they do, they rule uh, and manipulate systems and organizations and, and uh, institutions. They This is where they find uh, their manifestation so that any any organization anything that is uh, a system whether it be a, a corporation a church a synagogue uh, a place of religious establishment a, um, a some sort of a, a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen it doesn't matter what it is and I mentioned these last things because they're supposed to be inherently good right I mean they're doing good and yet even there we find that that there is still somehow a manipulation by the principalities in them. So we went from there to, to comprehending, well, how do we how do we overcome them? And how do we, as it says in Ephesians 6, how do we wrestle them? How do we wrestle the principalities and powers? And we looked at Ephesians 3, and how in Ephesians 3 it, it says that we are supposed to display the manifest wisdom of God to the principalities and powers. And there's this idea that it, it seems like that's Paul's telling us that this is what defeats them. So we're given this mandate by Paul to display the manifest wisdom of God to the principalities and powers. I want to this time come to this idea of the cities of refuge. In the Old Testament, there were these cities of refuge in the tribes of Israel that uh, if, if someone were to accidentally kill another person, they could run to this city of refuge and they could hide there so that, that their blood would not be required of them because they accidentally killed someone. And, and there are a couple of examples. I think the classic example is they swing an axe and the blade comes off and hits their, their companion. Well, they didn't, they didn't mean to do that. It was an accident. And, and we have a lot of ideas. You know, if, you're, if you're driving your car and somebody rides their bike right out in front of you and you hit on your brakes and you try but you can't stop, I mean, that's not your fault, right? So... That that was the that was what the cities of refuge were established for is a place that people could run to, to find refuge because they needed it from the avenger of blood essentially. Now, when we take this into a spiritual kind of context, the avenger of blood is is pretty much Satan. You know, those who who want to flee from Satan, who it seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. Where is it that they run to? The word principality would seem to indicate some sort of higher degree of demonic influence, uh, maybe over a governmental role, where the power might indicate the powers of nature and forces outside of man's ability to control. So you have, for example, in Psalm 82, these, uh, I think the rulers, I think, the, I think that the um, words translated as rulers, who shall be judged as mere men. And when you read it, you, I've heard people who, who would say, oh no, th these are just kings who think that they're above humanity. But I, I wonder if maybe there's something else to it, that maybe these are not just kings of anything. <laughs> they're the principalities and powers. And how do we, how do we get from them? Um, it is much better to know the spiritual problem and to be able to treat those symptoms than to somehow think that because you can identify that you're wrestling python okay this is i don't know where i'm going with this powerpoint now let me see if i can connect the dots between the two statements um when we try to take the cities of refuge into a spiritual connotation how can what do, what is it that we're talking about i'll just go ahead and lay it out for you at the beginning i don't know if i'm going to put it plainly or not later I think, as the body of Christ, as the people of God, we are supposed to be a city of refuge. First, to Israel, ethnic Israel, who has been temporarily cast off, but also to the world, those who are seeking truth, those who are seeking freedom. I think that we, as God's people, are supposed to be a city of refuge, where people can take shelter from the avenger of blood, the one who seeks their very soul and the termination of their soul. So
so I ha I have here. Let's see if I can't. Um, <clears throat> I think that that the word principality. I should have put this a lot sooner than just here. Uh, when we're talking about principalities and powers, I think that the principality deals with a a usurping governing authority that is over uh, the governments or in, or systems. I guess they're they're the principalities and powers of the air. Uh, this this idea of powers being of nature this comes from um, Hendrik Burkhoff I think was his name uh, but he wrote he wrote a book I think it was even titled the powers of the air or the principalities and powers and I have to look it up again um, he wrote a book on on this trying to comprehend what is it that Paul's getting at here um, I believe it's Hendrik Burkhoff uh, he he suggests that the the word that Paul uses here for powers would would connect us back to this this idea of natures and, and forces of nature that are outside of man's ability to control. Essentially, you have um, in the ancient world there's the god of the sun. The sun has to rise in order for it to feed the plants sunlight. Otherwise, the plants don't grow. There has to be rain in order for it to water the plants, or else they don't grow. So there, there are these gods of these forces that if, if these forces do not do their job, we cannot live. It's absolutely out of man's ability to control. It's out of our hands. And so there are these powers of nature that people come to to worship. And what's what they're actually worshiping is this principality, this demonic force. They're not just worshiping this dumb idol, this block of wood or gold or whatever it is that they made their idol out of, they're actually worshiping a, a legitimate principality that's usurping their their ability to perceive so that they can they can be worshipped by humanity. Now to come here, there there's this idea in, in Christendom, specifically within Charismatica, if I can call it that, the charismatic movement, Pentecostalism, there's this idea that if you can identify and name the de demon that you're dealing with, then you can pray in such and such a manner, say these words, here's a formula, if you perform these rituals, there you go ahead, that, that, that'll, that'll get rid of Python or, or of Jezebel or of whatever demon you're dealing with. That kind of notion is pagan in its origin. What, what what I want to get at, to wrestle in this way, is to embrace the very wisdom of demons, which is expediency. It is satanic to think in this manner. This is what we're taught in the, in the ways of the world, right? This is, this is what we're taught to think like in, in high school and, and through the systems of the world. Through the education system and through the through through media and all of the other platforms by which we're taught and told as to how to think, how to reason, to to wrestle the principalities and, and the very wisdom and, and demeanor of the principalities, it, it's fighting fire with fire. It doesn't work. These manifestations of lust, sexual addiction, pride, rebellion, etc., in our society and culture are actually branches to a root cause. There's a deeper root. There's a principality that, that needs to be engaged. And the way we wrestle with it is not by coming to know the name of this principality and, and trying to wrestle it. The way that we wrestle the principalities is by being the people of God who live by a different, uh, a different wisdom, who have a completely different demeanor, and by being that city of refuge. We are to manifest the wisdom of God, and by that demonstration, we are overcoming. We manifest the light, which is the wisdom of God, and that manifestation or demonstration is what uproots them. It is the wisdom of the powers of darkness to take the temporal things that are passing and to give them great value. Then they take the eternal things that will endure forever and give them of no value, call them worthless. So you have things like um, songs on, on the radio that glorify uh, drinking and, and sex and all of these other stupid things that are going to destroy your body as well as your soul 
and they glorify it and say, nope, I don't want to think about what, what comes tomorrow. I don't want to think about what, ha what happens after death. I want to live right now, right now in the moment. Right here. That kind of thinking is specifically from the principalities and powers, from the demonic uh, consideration. They give these things that are temporary and already passing away, and they give them great value. But then the things that are eternal, what will happen tomorrow? What will happen when I pass away? Those considerations are scoffed and laughed at and called primitive. Can we be a people who are enshrouded with the eternal perception? That, that, that see the things that are, are eternal as the things that are given great significance and of, of impossible worth. To, there, it, there's no price you can put on it. Can we be those people? The things of wealth, power, prestige, sexual pleasure, making a name for yourself. These sorts of things are given much more credence and praise than they should. The things of eternity, heaven and hell, eternal reward and eternal punishment. These things are made into a mockery. God is after a demonstration of his wisdom. God's wisdom is to consider the eternal God's wisdom is to lay down your life so that you might find life. God's wisdom, in a phrase, is the cross and resurrection. The things of, of the world here, wealth, power, prestige, sexual pleasure, making a name for yourself, self-gratification, self-preservation, self-promotion, these are the things that the principalities are, are constantly trying to get us to consider. Because we have not sought to be free from their wisdom, and because we have not considered that church is community or not at all, we think it's a building, we think it's we go to and have, have fellowship and, and we have some sort of gathering together with community worship or communal worship or whatever people call it, and etc. Church is a community, it's a daily or, or at least frequent gathering together. Because we've forsaken that idea, that at the beginning... The first expression in the book of Acts, when we read Acts chapter 2, the very end, what does it say? They went from house to house daily breaking bread. They called it nothing their own, but they, they gave, they distributed as each had need. Because we've, we've completely ignored that passage, we have employed the wisdom of the kingdom of darkness instead of opposing it. We see ministers who build their own kingdoms via mass mailings, crocodile teals, tears, emotionalism, hype, manipulation, threat, public relations methods, hope of reward, playing on the heartstrings when we give the altar call. There are some ministers who will even curse anyone who opposes their ministry. How can you be employing the wisdom of God which is sacrificial and curse someone? Employment of, of the principalities' methods ultimately shows that there is the deeper there is the deeper problem. It's a lack of authenticity. The man who is authentic before God does not allow anything to come in between his relationship with God. If that means willingly being poor, so be it. If that means moving to a place of obscurity and hiddenness, so be it. If that means moving to the other side of town so that you could see the, the other believers more frequently, so be it. If that means forfeiting popularity, so be it. If the first priority is the glory of God being manifest throughout all the earth, if that is your first priority, then nothing will stop you from doing whatever it takes for that glory of God to be manifest. Beyond that, it does not matter what we have and what we don't have, what we do, what we don't do. The question is, is God being glorified? Is this really bringing glory to God? Is this really what he's purposed in his heart? That's the question. 1 Timothy 2 begins, I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, and intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Have you ever been caught by that last part? 
we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is what the Apostle desired. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That is engaging the powers. That is overcoming the powers. That is living in the wisdom of God. I don't have to go out and do and be excited and, and adrenaline rush and razzmatazz. I can live peaceful and quietly in all godliness and holiness. I don't need the loud amplifiers and the excitement and, and jolt me into excitement, please. I don't need it. Just think about how contrary that is to the wisdom of the powers of darkness. Ambition, wealth, promotion, exaltation, greed, popularity, prestige. These are the most powerful of temptations. This is why the call is made to live simply and not to pursue those things. This reminds me of Paul's other statement regarding himself. I'm content in all things. And I'd like to pose the question to you. You might be comfortable, but are you content how is it that we can be cities of refuge? How is it that as communities we can live in a way that we are a city of refuge to those who are seeking solace in our own towns, in our own cities, in our own states, in our own countries? How might we be a city of refuge? Whether in, in a certain locality or globally, it is so that we might be this, the opposite of what the world is promoting and expecting. That we might live in a way that is absolutely opposite of everything that the world tells us we're supposed to do and be. I ask again, you might be comfortable, but are you content? Your life might make you comfortable that you have all sorts of luxury, but are you content with where you are? Or does something rise up in you as I'm talking and you say, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I've been searching. It is one thing to live this way as an individual, but, it, but could you imagine an entire community of believers, whether five or five thousand, can you imagine an entire community of believers that are bent upon a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and holiness? There, there are a people in, um, in Germany and Switzerland's history they were called the Distilla in Landa, the quiet ones in the land. They were, specifically, they were all Anabaptists, actually. Martin Luther called them demon-possessed because there's no way that they could possibly have that kind of godliness and holiness. In Switzerland, they were, they were taken into their buildings of, of uh, their community buildings of gathering and worship, and, and they were burned alive. Um, others were, were gathered up and tied together by, with, by their hands behind their backs and thrown into the river so they'll be drowned. This is, this is the result of when you, do, when you go against the principalities and powers. They will not tolerate your existence. All you want is to live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and holiness. And all the principalities do is balk at it. They want nothing like this to be ex in existence. When you read Numbers 35, 6, let me turn there since I obviously don't have that up. Forgive me. Numbers 35, verse 6. Now among the cities which you will give to the Levites, you shall appoint six cities of refuge to which the manslayer may flee, into which you shall add 42 cities. So, to be, this, to be this city of refuge, we want to be a priestly community, living in all godliness and holiness, in sobriety and in solemnity, to be a refuge during the time of Jacob's trouble. But once again, how can we be a refuge during the time of Jacob's trouble if we're not a refuge now? How can we live like that then if we're not doing it now? Turn to Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. I, this, is, this, has, this verse has become 
so dear to me. It's almost a mantra, <laughs> how often I, I seem to quote it. Uh, pardon me. Then the woman, Israel, fled into the wilderness where she was taken. I have a bad version here. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where they took care of her for Ah, I see. Sorry. I'm still breaking in this new Bible. It's a new King James, and I've been reading the NIV for so long. And before that, it was the King James. I'm just not familiar. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should take care of her, or feed her, for 1,260 days. I'm, I'm happy to see that, that the new King James does put the they there, because that's the proper translation of the word. Um, who are the they? I believe it's I believe that it's this this idea the city of refuge it's the body of Christ it's the it's the cities that have been established throughout the wilderness places throughout all of the world and so that even in even in the city you might be in a metropolis and yet you're still living in a wilderness place because you're so outside of the systems and you're trying to grow your own food instead of going to the grocery store and you're trying to not be reliant upon Egypt and upon the principalities and the institutions, but you're living as a quiet one in the land. Do you, do you get what I'm saying here? Um, you don't have to be in a physical desert or a physical wilderness or a physical wasteland where there aren't very many people. You might be in the city, but the very way that you're living, the way the lifestyle you have is very much a wilderness because you're completely outside of everything that people can't fall that people would call and consider normative, average. And because you're living like that, you are a refuge for those who are fleeing, whether it's Israel in the last days, or whether it's the Native Americans now, or whether it's the people like myself who sought for truth and reality, couldn't find it in Christianity, couldn't find it in atheism, couldn't find it anywhere. Can you be that? To be the city of refuge, it is the life that is lived hidden with Christ and God that overcomes the evil one. The communities of saints that are living in that kind of willing's insignificance will alone possess the keys to shake the gates of hell. Are you willing to live in that kind of insignificance? Do you understand what I'm getting at here? This is a forfeiture of everything that you desire to be. Everything you desire to build for yourself. Are you willing to be considered insignificant, a nobody, a pariah, a people that are not a people? But who is willing for this? Who's willing to work at their jobs and not seek a raise or promotion? Who is willing to live a life that does not bring attention to themselves? Who's willing to be a minister of the Lord and not promote your ministry? Who's willing to wait for God to reveal his mysteries instead of seeking to understand them in your own intelligence? If you come to a Bible passage and you read some verse and you think, well, that's really weird. I wonder what that means. Are you willing to rest and say, but God can reveal it to me in his time and to not try to seek it out and hunt it down yourself? Are you willing to remain a nobody until the voice of God rings forth, separate unto me? Are you willing to be content to live and remain where you're at in whatever community and fellowship you're at until God were to call, until God were to speak? Are you willing for that? Or are you continually wanting to rise and to do and to do and to do and to do? Are, can you be in Christ or must you do in Christ? Do you see what I'm asking here? This is utterly contrary to everything that we think and believe and want to be. And so I'm going to leave it here with that kind of challenge, and I hope that it registers in you. If you will rise to that, the principalities will take note of you, and you will not be the same. If you're willing to say yes to that, even if you don't know how, God will be there. So, I bless you who, who hear this and have listened all the way through, and and who are saying yes, I bless you and I do pray for you even now that God would take note 
because I know that the principalities take note. So, grace and peace to you in Christ, that you might live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and holiness, in that who you are with, not just yourself, but your wife with you, your children, your family, your community with you, might also join you in this call to be a city of refuge in a dark world where there are so few. Grace and peace to you in Christ and blessings. I hope to see you next time.